Yo what's going on guys Tanmay of our simple snippets and welcome back to another video tutorial under network security and today we are going to be discussing an important concept under network security that is the problem of key distribution and the Diffie-Hellman key distribution algorithm so up until now we've been seeing different types of cipher techniques we've seen what is symmetric key algorithm and asymmetric key cryptography we've seen the differences between the two and we've also seen two big algorithms in the previous couple of videos that is the des and the idea algorithm which are both symmetric key algorithms so if you have missed any of those videos you can check out this entire playlist i'll drop the link of the playlist and probably you can also see a card anyway starting off with today's topic now one major query or question that arises in this symmetric key cryptography is how do we communicate the key that is going to be used in encryption and decryption so as you can see on the diagram let's say alice stays in us okay and bob stays in india now they want to perform communication and they know that the network or the internet is not secure so they want to perform symmetric key cryptography so they are going to be using some des or idea or some symmetric key cryptography algorithm so in that case they have to have this shared private key right so this shared private key would be private among alice and bob only right so no third person will be knowing this private key now the practical question arises is how do they communicate this key with each other obviously alice cannot take a plane and travel all the way to india just to share that key to bob right they cannot do it physically and this is the major problem that happens in most of the cases because it is not necessary that the sender and receiver or the parties that are going to perform the communication stay nearby so that they can physically share that key right so it has to be done on the network on the internet initially at least one time so this is where the problem of key distribution arises and it is inherently linked with symmetric key cryptography and the reason is because in symmetric key only one single key is used both for encryption as well as decryption right so if they are going to be sharing this private key it is going to be used for both encryption as well as decryption so it has to be private and it cannot be sent to any other third person let's say for example in the diagram you can see if they are sharing this private key on some not secure internet or network this storm who's a hacker or a intruder can basically read this private key and then he can decrypt the messages that are being passed between the sender and receiver right so there has to be some mechanism so this is where the diffie hellman key exchange algorithm works and let's talk a little bit about that so in diffie hellman key exchange agreement algorithm two parties can agree on a symmetric key using this technique okay so it can be used for encryption and decryption which means that once they agree on that key you can use it to perform encryption and decryption however this algorithm can be used only for key agreement or exchange it is not used for encryption or decryption so this diffie hellman key exchange algorithm as the name suggests is only used to transfer or to share that private key among the two parties who are going to be performing the communication and it is basically based on mathematical principles which we'll see in a minute how it works so i have the algorithm over here but if you just read it out it won't be very clear so i have a diagram which we will see and then we'll try to go step by step according to this algorithm okay okay so as you can see on the screen we have the algorithm on the left and we have the step by step process that is happening in the diagram so let's read each and every step in the algorithm and let's then come back to the diagram to apply that step so step number 1 is firstly alice and bob agree upon two large prime numbers okay this is n and g now the reason why they take prime numbers is because mathematical calculations with prime numbers is very tedious and these prime numbers are very large which means that they have like around 9 or 10 digits which makes it even more difficult to calculate and crack so right now what we are going to do is we are going to take two prime numbers but they are not large because we are just taking an example so for step number 1 we are taking n equals to 11 and g equals to 7 okay so these are two large prime numbers n and g and according to this algorithm these two numbers need not be secret and can be shared publicly which means that alice and bob mutually agree on this two numbers and share it publicly on the insecure network which means that even if the third person gets n and g it's okay because ultimately the key that is going to be calculated will be secret and we'll see that how it becomes secret even though n and g are publicly available okay so alice chooses another large random number x which is private to her so this is step number 2 over here you can see i've marked it over here alice chooses another random number x which is private to her which means that this x that alice chooses which is equal to 3 that we are taking over here is going to be only private to alice and nobody else is going to know this number 
Okay. So this is step number two. And Alice calculates a. So Alice calculates a new value a such that the formula is g raised to x mod n. So g we know is seven and it is known to everyone. X is only known to Alice and x here we are assuming is three. We are taking small numbers so that calculation becomes easy. So seven raised to three and mod n. So I hope you know what is modulo operation. It is used to get the remainder and uh, it is used to limit the output of certain value. Okay. So g raised to x, which is seven raised to three, is three forty three, right? So seven raised to three is equal to three forty three and mod n. So n is eleven. So mod eleven is gonna give you two. So if you don't know how to perform mod, let me just quickly show you. So you just take three forty three. You take eleven and divide it. So eleven three is a thirty three. You get one over here. Then you take three over here. Eleven ones a eleven. Subtract it and you get two. And since it is not further divisible, instead of taking the quotient, you take this remainder as the output. So that's why we get the value of two. So this is how you get a is equal to seven raised to three. So seven is g, which is seven. Three is x, which is only known to Alice. And mod eleven is n, which is known to everyone. And then you get the output of two. Okay. So you got a new number a. Which is equal to two. Now, what happens is at step number three, Alice sends this newly calculated number to Bob. So you can see this arrow blue. A is being sent to Bob, and A is equal to two. So again, this is on the insecure network. So any other third person also can take this value and read this value of A equals to two. So even though A is insecure, ultimately the key is going to be private to both. We'll see how that works. Let's move on to step number four. Now for step number four, Bob chooses another large random number y, which is again private to him. So this is step number four. Let's say Bob chooses y equals to six. We are taking small numbers so that calculation is easy. And Bob calculates his own number, which is b, and it is given by the formula g raised to y mod n. So now g is again seven. We know that six is the number that Bob chooses as y, which is private to him. So seven raised to six mod eleven is going to give you four. You can use your calculator to calculate these values, and then. At step number five, Bob sends this b, which he calculated, to Alice on the insecure network. So now Alice has b equals to four, Bob has a equals to two. So let's move on to step number six. Now Alice computes her secret key k one as follows. So there is one more formula involved over here, which is k one is equal to b raised to x mod n. So this is that step number six. So Alice is calculating her own private key k one. Which is given by b raised to x mod n, and this b is coming from Bob. X Alice already has as her private number, and mod n, so n is already known globally. So k one she gets as four raised to three, so b is four, right? So four raised to three mod eleven, which is equal to nine. Similarly, for the last step, Bob computes his own secret key k two as follows. So k two is a raised to y mod n. You can see at step number seven, this a is coming from Alice, right? In the step number three. So Bob takes this a. He performs a raised to y. So y he already had as a private number. So that is two raised to y mod eleven. Eleven is known glo globally, and the answer here again is nine. So finally, you can see that key exchange is successful, and k one and k two is matching, which means that both of them have the same key. Now you must be wondering how did this happen, and there was some things that were shared on the unsecure network that is n and g. And even a and b values were shared on the network. However, if you notice that x value which Alice had private and y value which Bob had private is not shared on the internet, right? So this is why the hacker does not know these values. So the hacker cannot directly calculate b raised to x because hacker does not have x, and hacker also cannot calculate k two that is a raised to y because he does not have y. Even though hacker has this b value, a value. n value and g value he does not have x and y right so he cannot finally calculate however there is a drawback to defi element key exchange and we will see that in further video which is known as man in the middle attack and we will see that in further video right now let's just see how this algorithm worked that is you still must be wondering how did k1 and k2 became equal right so let's see what is the mathematical crux behind this entire algorithm Now this is the theory that is the mathematical theory behind this entire algorithm. Let's read it step by step, and you'll understand it very easily. So firstly, take a look at what Alice does in step number six. So let's see the diagram. At step number six, Alice says k one is equal to b raised to x mod n. Okay, right? This is the step. 
So what is this B? So B is coming from step number four over here, right? And B's formula is g raised to y mod n. So let's substitute this g raised to y mod n at this location. Okay, let's substitute g raised to y mod n over here. So the new value of k1 would be g raised to y mod n, and we already had one x extra. So we are just taking that over here, and we are not doing mod n two times because modulo operation is done only one time. We are just using it to limit it under certain value. So modulo operations are usually performed when we want to restrict the output to certain range. Okay, so that's why we are doing it only one time. So I hope you are getting it over here. What we are doing, we are taking b raised to x mod n. So this is the formula for k1. Now the b value is actually g raised to y mod n, right? Which is over here. You can see. So we are just substituting g raised to y mod n at this place, and we are getting a new value of k1, which is g raised to y. X is already there, so x is outside the bracket and mod n. Which ultimately gives us g raised to y x mod n. Okay, so this is basic algebra, right? Now let's take a look at what Bob does in step number seven. So this was Alice's end. Now let's see what happens at Bob's end. So at step number seven, Bob is calculating his own key k two, which is a raised to y mod n. You can see over here formula. So what is this a? So a is coming from step number two, where a's formula is g raised to x mod n, right? You can see. A's formula is g raised to x mod n. So let's substitute g raised to x mod n, that is this value, in this formula of k2. So then k2 is g raised to x, and then y is extra over here. So we are just putting it outside bracket, and mod n is already there, right? So which is ultimately g raised to x y mod n. So we got k1 as g raised to y x mod n, and we got k2 as g raised to x y mod n. Now if you understand the basic algebraic logic. That is basic mathematics. We know that k is to y x is always equal to k is to x y. So the order doesn't matter, right? So if you look at point number one and point number two, g is to y x mod n is going to be equal to g is to x y mod n, right? So that is the reason why k one and k two are always going to be equal to k, which means that they are going to be same in every situation if you perform these steps exactly as they are. So this is the basic mathematical crux behind Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm, and this is how it works when you want to share the symmetric key between two parties. So that's it for this video, guys. I hope you understood the entire concept of Diffie-Hellman key exchange and when it is needed, what is the problem of key exchange and why it happens, and the mathematical crux behind the Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm. So in the next video, what we'll see is we'll see a drawback of this algorithm wherein the hacker. Uses some basic mathematical calculations to get the actual key, and this is not a foolproof method. So there is an attack known as man-in-the-middle attack, which can be applied on this Diffie-Hellman key exchange to get that private key. So in the next video, we'll see that. But I hope you understood this Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm and the entire working. So that's it for this video, guys. If you like this video, if you understood the concept, please give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments that you like this video. Share it with your friends as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed on this channel. Make sure you subscribe so that you get notified whenever I upload a new video. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.